من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين أما بعد we are going to continue to explain understandings vis-a-vis -vis misunderstandings of Islam because this topic is key uh, to how we live as Muslims, how we deal with our faith, and how we deal with each other and with the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last time we explained part of the ayah, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-Islam deena. Today, I have completed your faith for you and I have perfected uh, my bounties upon you and I am pleased to have Islam as your faith. Very clear, straightforward ayah from Allah. Uh, many of the scholars would tell us that this was the last ayah to be sent down in the Quran. Uh, some others say the other ayah is وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ They cite this second ayah as the last ayah to be sent down uh, in the Quran. But irrespective of which of them is the last, definitely the ayah that says uh, today I have completed your faith for you is clearly talking about the completion of the religion. Last time we explained that the completion of the religion means that there is nothing missing to fill in, there is nothing incomplete to complete it, there is nothing wrong to fix it, and there is nothing that warrants misunderstanding to clear it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also in the Quran, ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَ Then it is on us to make it clear. It is on Allah to make it clear. So He guaranteed the authenticity of the text, the authority of the text, the correctness of the text, the completeness of the text, and that this text needs nothing from outside, and he also added, the clarity of the text is on him. He will explain it to us. It doesn't mean that we need not scholars to explain. And it doesn't mean that there is nothing in the Quran that anybody could find difficult to understand as far as language. But it means that the message is so simple to require a system to explain it, meaning you don't need a hierarchy, you don't need a priest, you can read the Quran, and Allah promised, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ We have made this recital an easy one, the Quran, is there anyone to recite? He is calling us. So the mere fact that Allah has said that it is on him to clear it, meaning for understanding, it means no one should complain or should use the language barrier as a problem. The Quran further added in our attempt to understand Quran, above all of this, if something is not clear, then just ask those who have knowledge. Ask the scholars. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Even though this ayah, ask the people of the book, if you do not know, was referring to the people of the book, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us another ayah clearly for us, saying, وَلَوْ رَدُّوهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ وَإِلَىٰ أُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْهُمْ لَعَلِمَهُ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَنْبِطُونَهُ مِنْهُمْ if they find something difficult to understand or how to apply, if they just refer it to the messenger, meaning to the sunnah left for us by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, 
or to those who have knowledge among them, then they would be able to figure it out for them. لَعَلِمَهُ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَنْبِطُونَهُ مِنْهُمْ So the Quran itself gave us a way to navigate the Quran and to understand it. But still, we are finding it difficult. We claim that it is difficult. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا We have made it easy. We say, no, it is difficult. Even the Arabs are saying it is difficult. And that's because of some pragmatic career reasons. But the majority are assuming that it is difficult for everybody, including highly educated people. Some practical reasons could be language barrier. If you don't speak Arabic, then you don't understand the Arabic language. That's understood. But why should the Arabs say, I don't understand? It is because the Arabs have separated and divorced the language and the Quran centuries ago. We've started to copy others, both in language, in speech, in writing, in everything that we have lost the connection with the language of the Quran, so the Quran itself became estranged from us and we became estranged from the Quran. We are alienating ourselves from the Quran. But Allah is still saying, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكَرِ There is not a single art or science that anybody learned and was good at from the first time. It's only by reading, rereading, rereading, asking questions, learning what you have read, and digging in the books so that you know what you're learning. And that's why education takes us like 16, 17 years to finish between elementary and college. Why? Because that's what it takes to graduate somebody who knows something about something, whether it is engineering or science or anything else. Just to know how to navigate your way inside the books, it takes you 16 years. Allah gives you 60 years, 40 years and more to study the Quran before you leave this world. You spend it doing everything but reading the Quran and trying to study the Quran. How could we understand our deen? How could we understand our deen when we have divorced the source of knowledge and assume things about it? And we are hearing more about it from the enemies of Islam than we are hearing about it from the scholars of Islam. Ask any scholar, what is so difficult in the Quran? He says the only difficult thing is deserting the Quran. Deserting the Quran, not reading the Quran. So much so that Allah tells us in the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ will come on the day of judgment and submit a complaint to Allah. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا Oh my Lord, the Messenger will say, Oh Allah, my people, my community have taken this book into desertion. When you desert anything, do you learn it? You don't learn it. But if you try anything, some way, sometime, you will learn it. You will be even good at it. Ask yourself, when you started to drive a car, was it easy? Was it not scary? Didn't it seem difficult? But because you want to do it, you put the time, you put the resolution and the effort to drive despite the risk to your life. You decided to do it. Ask any physician when they started to train on patients, how scary was it that he may cause somebody more harm than good? It is scary, but they keep learning and learning and learning until they are good at it and they get certified to do that. Why is it that we are wasting an entire life doing everything but the study of the guidance that we were created to follow.
Why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we damage our own fate? Why do we damage our relationship with Allah? Why don't we even ask those questions? And why don't you, we do something about it? It is because we have taken the comfort Allah gave us in this life and we are happy with it. As I always say, it is like a child. You give a child a gift, he runs with it, he's playing with it before he thinks to say thank you. But if we don't say thank you to Allah, our life could finish before we get a chance to say thank you Allah the way we should. Protect yourself from Allah's anger and wrath as you ought to protect yourself. Fear him as he ought to be feared. How do we fear Allah the way he ought to be feared if we do not read his book, we don't understand what he's saying, and we don't know what he expects of us, and we live a life of trouble, and at the end of every day, we are venting to ourselves or to the jinn or to each other about how miserable and difficult this life is. We make it difficult. Allah didn't, meant, didn't mean this life to be that difficult. He meant it to be a trial, yes, a test, yes, but we call on ourselves the miseries of life mostly by our own hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ Whatever difficulty or trouble that you get in this life, it is because of what your hands have earned. That answers all the claims. Your hands earn you more trouble than they earn you more blessings. It means you are doing something wrong and primarily you are not doing the right things. Whether you know and you don't do it or you don't know and that's why you don't do it. So learning becomes the first step to understanding Islam. And the first step in learning is to connect with the Quran. And the first strongest motive to learn the Quran is to understand and settle that issue that the Quran will help you craft your way to paradise. Unless you hold it dear and close to your chest and clear in your head and blessed in your heart, it is very difficult, if not impossible, that anyone could craft a way to paradise. It is the map that can take us there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all among the people of paradise. So what is the definition of deen and why are Muslims really confused about that definition? The West looks at religion as a belief that you have in your heart and some supplications or prayers that you do between you and Allah. So what is deen in the definition of the Quran? In the language, Deen comes from the root word dayana, to give a loan. And for the borrower of the loan to engage in a debt agreement. So what are we indebted to Allah for? In fact, the question is wrong. The question is what it is that we are not indebted for Allah for. We are indebted to Allah for everything. He doesn't give us just life, the body that you use, every member of your body, every sense of who you are, your ancestor, your language, the care you got when you were young, and everything there is in this life is part of his gifts. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنْ اللَّهِ Whatever you have of bliss, it is from Allah. ثُمَّ إِذَا مَسَّكُمُ الضُّرُّ فَإِلَيْهِ تَجْأَرُونَ Then when something harmful befalls you, you just scream and ask Allah earnestly 
I want this, protect me from this, cure me from that, save me from this, give me relief in that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, whatever blessings we have, it is all from Him, from Allah. So we are indebted for the gift of life, the gift of blessings, and those blessings are unlimited. Unlimited. Imagine Allah telling us in the Quran, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مِنْهُمْ He has subjected everything there is in heaven and in the earth, all of it for you. Can you believe that this whole creation is subjected to your utility? Use it. But Allah says, use it according to his guidance. You know, if we were talking like five centuries ago, it would have been difficult to explain. What is the relationship between Allah creating us and Allah commanding us to do things his way? It would have been very difficult. But today, with all the technological tools we have in our hands, and every one of them comes with a manual from the manufacturer to tell you how to use it, otherwise it's not gonna work. We know that much, that every piece that any manufacturer makes comes with a manual, a direction. How is it that the most complicated creation of Allah Man would come without one. Am khuliqu min ghayr shay'in am humul khaliqoon. Have they been created without no creator? Or did they create themselves? The Quran asks. How do they live on their own? How do they associate gods with Allah? How do people remember Allah only when they are in trouble? And when he puts them in trouble to ask him, they freak out and they are desperate and they don't like it. But this is the only way you respond. This is the only way you will live. But Allah out of his mercy doesn't treat us tit for tat. He is so merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُلَّا نُمِدُّ هَؤُلَاءِ وَهَؤُلَاءِ مِنْ عَطَاءِ رَبِّكَ we provide both the obedient and the rebellious, the believer and the disbeliever. We provide both groups from the bounties of Allah. And Allah's bounties are never limited. There is no one that can limit what Allah gives, what Allah keeps. He decides and we use what he gives us, all what he's asking. And behold and remember, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed, if you are grateful, if you show gratitude, I will give you more. If you deny and rebel, then wait for my punishment for my punishment is very severe. So it is a reciprocal relationship, but it is not tit for tat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأُمْلِي لَهُمْ I extend a chance for them. Those who are rebelling, those who are acting out of their arrogance and tyranny and oppressive nature, those who are using their wicked side of their soul, Allah says, I'm extending them chance after chance after chance until when they are caught, they can never slip away. When Allah holds someone, he's finished. He's finished, whether it is an individual or a community or a nation, no matter how powerful this nation may be. Every nation, no matter how big, no matter how strong, no matter how arrogant, no matter how good they are in controlling and manipulating others, 
they have a time limit. They have a term of life. The Quran tells us about the tug of war between Persia and Rome. And for those who think that Islam has nothing to do with politics, they need to go read the Quran. Why does the Quran title an entire surah under the name of Rome, a room? It's an amazing. And it starts off by Ghulibatul Rome. Rome has been defeated in the close proximity area near the northern Arabia. Ghulibatul Rome, fi adna al ard. وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ What does Muhammad have to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with Persia defeating Rome or Rome defeating Persia? Why? Is he talking politics? Is he getting out of line? Is he getting out of the area that he was supposed to speak about? Did he forget his mission? What does he have to do with Rome and Persia? But it does have to do, otherwise Allah would not mention it. And then, ثُمَّ إِنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبٍ سَيَغْلِبُونَ They will come back and defeat the Persians. يَوْمَئِذٍ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ يَنْصُرُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Then the believers will celebrate and will be joyful for the victory of Allah and the support of Allah that He gives to whom he wills. So why is the Quran talking about this nation defeating that nation, that nation will defeat them back, and this tug of war? What does religion have to do with war? And war in which the Arabs were not involved. The Muslims were not involved in that war. It is like World War I, World War II. Millions of people have not have, have, have not uh, continued their life, they lost their life because of these wars. And with all of these millions, the West is not ashamed to call Muslims terrorists. It will take Muslims, if they continue to kill, which we don't agree with, if they continue to use violence, Again, it's combatant and non-combatant, the way they have been doing it. It will take them, those groups that use violence as a way for life, which is not agreeable to Muslims or Islam. If they continue to do this, they will need more than 50 years or more to kill 2 million people. Not 21 like the World War I and not the number of World War II. So brothers and sisters, read your book to understand your faith. Those Muslims who say that Islam and the sheikhs and the Quran has nothing to do with politics, it's religion. Yes, that is true, but according to whose definition? It's according to the Western definition. Why did the West divorce religion? Why did they divorce Allah from public sphere? And they kept it in their heart, in their church, at home. Why did they restrict Allah from guiding public life? And they are using their own sense of morality, sense of right and wrong, so much badly that what is wrong is becoming more than what is right. We are losing the moral campus as a Western society because those who have faith stopped talking to those who, have, who are driving the ship. The train is getting wrecked more than once, but people like to fix it and keep going in the same direction. Empire after empire have been falling and we don't learn. We keep repeating the same mistakes. Why? Because good people are silent, which means approval. And their silence is taken as approval. And who are the good people? 
Those are the people that claim to love Allah. Those are the people who claim to believe in Allah, in His guidance. And those are the people who claim to live by the moralities, the spiritualities they learn from their faith. If we are not in the front, then we belong to the back alleys. And that's where we are today. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't be only ahead of others when it comes to leadership, standing for justice, sacrificing, guiding, enjoining the good, forbidding the evil. But even among those who do all of that, you be the first of Muslims. وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Don't just be with the group. Compete. This is where competition is. وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ We are competing for worldly gains, but we are not competing to advance our spiritual leadership. We are not doing what we should be doing. And if I have been harsh in the way I'm talking to you when it comes to understanding Islam, it is because a very frustrating issue that we have been living as Muslims, according to our claim, for 1400 years. And the result is our situation is the worst. So others have the right to blame Islam for it. So we either stop claiming that we are Muslims, stop claiming that we are living as Muslims, so that we leave Islam alone, or else be serious about it and take your faith seriously. But don't do the two. Don't claim that you are a Muslim, we are a Muslim Ummah, we are Muslim this and Muslim that, and our reality speaks to a miserable community, a community that is divided, even based on their understanding of their own faith. Brothers and sisters, we bring this kind of misery upon ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا Don't you get into disputes, otherwise you would fail. Allah says, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And hold on to the rope of Allah, all of you together. And what are we doing? We are leaving the book of Allah and we are holding on to everything else. That's why we are divided. Everybody is looking to a corner to pick an idea and come to impose it on the community. And we got affected and infected by imported cultures, either because of colonialism or inculturalization or interaction with other nations and other world faith communities. And we borrow more than we lend. We pick from them more than we pick from our own faith. Look at our children. What are they doing? This week, they are celebrating Halloween, right? And in few weeks, they are gonna celebrate Thanksgiving. In few more weeks, Christmas. In few more weeks, the feast of what, Valentine? February, right? Do I memorize it right? Somebody can help me. The new year, see, I'm missing it. So we celebrate everything, but when it comes to celebrating the biggest gift of Allah by turning the Qur'an into beneficial guidance, we are not celebrating the Qur'an. We are not celebrating the Qur'an. We are not celebrating the biggest gift Allah has given us. So if we want to be dear to Allah, we have to make His word dear to us. For our own sake, this is not a favor that we do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a favor to ourselves. Man 
he who follows the guidance, he himself is the one who gets guidance. He is the one who benefits from the guidance he follows. And he who loses the way and goes astray, he goes astray to the detriment of his own soul. We condemn ourselves by not following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to keep us as a light first to ourselves and to our community and to our ummah. And I ask him to enable us to be guidance also for others. The world is looking for leadership, spiritual leadership. People has already, have already given up on their own justice system, which delivers more injustice than justice. People have given up on politicians to give us a better tomorrow because they work for themselves much more than they work for anybody else. People have given up on even religious leaders who are leading themselves and their communities in the wrong direction. The only thing left is that they pick the reference that is secure, authentic, and guarded, the Quran, and follow it. May Allah help us follow the Quran. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salat wa salam wa ala ibadihi al-ladhin astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna sayyidina ulana muhammadan abduhu wa rasul wa ba'd Brothers and sisters, as we said in the beginning, deen comes from dayana to loan somebody something. Embedded in that meaning the fact that Everything we have is a loan, including our life. You as a father or mother, you are here on a loan from Allah for your family. When the loan term's over, you're gone. Your children are also here on a loan. Whenever anyone's term's over, he's gone. As a community, unless we fulfill our responsibility in bringing more peace, more justice, more love, more care, more compassion to this world, our term will be over and Allah threatens. If you do not fulfill it, he will substitute you and replace you with others. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبِدِ الْقَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ if you turn away from the guidance of Allah, He would substitute you with others and they wouldn't be like you. Look at the condemnation. They wouldn't be like you. They wouldn't sell their faith short and they would not sell their neighbors short. They will not sell the world short of His right to the guidance of Allah. You know, on the Day of Judgment, your neighbors will come and hold on to your neck and pull you in front of Allah to complain against you. So when Allah asks them, why don't you believe in my book, in my messenger, in my guidance? They will say, he lived with us he ate from the food we planted. He worked in our factory, in our offices, but he never showed us what the light you gave them are. You better prepare an answer. So it's not only about even teaching Islam, it's about your leadership as a Muslim. What is most unfortunate is some of us are hiding our faith because the avalanche of Islamophobia is scaring many of us. Many of us are hiding our Islam. They don't want to pray. They don't want to ask to pray in their office. 
because they don't want to be known even as Muslims. Some go as far as even changing their name, thinking that this will hide them. Guess what? Islamophobes, they know you and they assume about you better than what you assume about yourself. They think you are Muslim. And if they want to punish you, it is because they think you are Muslim. So you get their punishment, and then you desert Islam, then you get the punishment of Allah in this life and in the hereafter. So it is a triple whammy. You are hurting your interest threefold by not living your deen, by not understanding your deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the fiqh of deen, the deep understanding of deen. Allahumma faqihna fi deen wa'allimna ta'weel. Allahumma faqihna fi deen wa'allimna ta'weel. Allahumma hdina fi man hadayt wa'afina fi man afayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa qina wa sarif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma qina wa sarif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma qina wa sarif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma qsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu biya baynana wa bayna maasiyatik wa min ta'atika ma tuballighuna bihi jannatak. ومن اليقين ما تهون بي علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة